This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I want to thank Peter for inviting me to give this talk. I was looking at the previous speakers and the speakers that are going to follow me, and, and it's a really nice lineup, so it's really a privilege to be here. So today, what I want to talk about is some approaches for how we plan our water systems for a changing climate. And to start, I kind of want to set the stage by just trying to impress upon you the challenge that we're actually facing. And I'm going to try this hyperlink because it's worth it. Hopefully it works. There we go. So this is an animation. And for those on the WebEx, if you go to Null School, you Google Null School and, and climate, you get this animation. I think it's really cool. What it's showing is a, an animation of a global climate model. And what we're looking at is winds in the middle of the atmosphere. What we're looking at is basically circulation across the globe. And that little green dot is about where we are. And what we're talking about when we talk about adapt adapting our water systems to climate change, it's really an issue of scale. So what we're trying to do is use global climate models to understand how this type of complex, highly nonlinear circulation is going to change as the, the climate warms, and how that's going to map down to our local water systems. Because water, really, it's a local issue. Occasionally, maybe the really big water systems are regional. But it's mainly a local issue when you're trying to map down that from, the, from a very large scale. And it, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or whatever to realize that that's going to be a difficult task. And it is. But before I get into some of those challenges, I want to zoom into the local scale. And I know we have a broad audience here. So I just want to talk about what I mean by water systems. OK. So first I want to do is just define hydrology. So natural hydrologic systems, hydrology, it's the science that encompasses the occurrence, distribution, and movement and properties of water of the Earth and how they relate to the environment. And so there are many different hydrologic regimes as you move across the globe from arid to semi-arid to human environments. I have a sort of an idealistic picture here from a hydrologic system, a watershed that we might imagine somewhere around us here. And so you have rainfall, and it's running off the surface into rivers. And a lot of that rainfall infiltrates into the ground and moves as groundwater. And for us, a society, what we're really interested in is not so much the natural hydrologic system, but the human hydrologic system. As we move into and develop in natural hydrologic systems, we want to understand how we interact with these systems. So for instance, you know, a common path has been agricultural development. And those farmers need to extract water to often irrigate their fields, so they might pump some groundwater. And you get more and more development. And you get towns and cities, and they might start extracting surface waters. And those cities, they want power, so they build thermoelectric power plants. Turns out you need a lot of water to cool those power plants. So we start really building up our water use. And in addition, we, we become vulnerable, just living in these river basins, to the hydrologic extremes that can cause a lot of damage. So for instance, we can have issues like flooding, which I think it's the, after hurricanes, the second largest monetary damage natural disaster that we face. And in response to these sorts of events, we start building up infrastructure projects to protect ourselves against these extremes. So one thing that we can do when we, you know, we're threatened by floods is build levees. So those little black lines along the cartoon there are supposed to depict levees, but they look something like that in the picture we're really raising up the banks of the river so that when the river rises during a flood, we're protected behind it. We can face the opposite type of hydrologic extreme, drought. So rain goes away, and we still want to use water. So to mitigate this, we build more infrastructure. One option is we sometimes build dams. And the nice thing about dams, they'll store water in times of excess when we have more than we need. And then we can draw on that water later during droughts. And these dams provide lots of other services, like hydropower production. They also are great for flood control. They can catch floods, recreation, and all sorts of things. We don't just face water quantity issues. We also face water quality issues. So a lot of times, there's a lot of runoff from farms. You get a lot of nutrient runoff that can cause uh, um, kind of out of control algal growth and ecological degradation. Same with sewer, uh, sewage. 
from municipalities, and we build more stuff to deal with that. So at least for the sewage, we build treatment plants. And I'm just giving a few small, you know, a few examples of the type of water infrastructure and water projects that we've developed, but we've developed a lot of them to try and mitigate a lot of these issues that arise when humans interact with hydrology. And the two main points I really want to make is a lot of these type of projects are very, very expensive, and they can be very contentious. And the reason they could be contentious is often when we start investing in our water systems, we're trying to meet many different objectives, and I've listed a few here. But often these objectives can conflict with one another, so that if you try and meet one objective, you can actually detract from another. And because water is inherently a public good, we kind of view it as something that the, the public owns, and a lot of uh, public dollars go into investing in infrastructure, it becomes a political issue. And there's no way of getting around that. And so, you know, here's a little cartoon from Engineering News Record a long time ago. But you have to get a lot of stakeholders together from representing many different interests. And they have to debate and negotiate over the type of investments that we're going to make in our water systems. Now, you know, how do we do this? How do we get a handle over, oh, before I do that, sometimes that negotiation doesn't go so well. So here are just two articles showing some, some cases where it's actually gone to the Supreme Court, these water conflicts. So on the right, there's uh, the tri-state water wars between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. On the left, actually during the recent Texas drought in 2011-12, uh, there was a, a conflict over water rights there. And so as engineers trying to plan these water systems, how do we go about getting our head around this multifaceted, multi-objective problem? Well, there's lots of places I could have tried to start. I was trying to think where's a good place to start with this. And I decided to start with something called the Harvard Water Program, which got going in the 50s. And that's when economists came together with engineers and tried to build up a, a, a systems approach to planning water systems. Where they take a systems focus, they look at many different objectives that they're trying to meet across the whole system. And what they're trying to do is identify the best alternatives that will maximize social net benefits across a series of objectives from a big pool of alternative decisions they could be making. And the way they did this is they built up essentially models, mathematical formulations that would link designs and plans to those objectives that they were trying to meet. And these models, they wouldn't necessarily always give the direct answer of you know, what you should do, but what they would do is help build a shared understanding among stakeholders and quantify the problem and help test different plans and designs and see how they work and see how they affect objectives. And so down here, the little picture, um, this is uh, one popular water systems model nowadays. It's called WEEP. And you can see a little schematic there, but the key to understand is that behind that is, is code and the math and formulating the system in a mathematical framework. So I put some code of mine of a water system simulation model on the right. The, the code doesn't matter. So just to kind of give you a sense of how this trade-off analysis would work. i do a, give you a little case study. So I did some work in the Connecticut River where there was concern about how hydropower uh, was being operated. And so here's a little uh, USGS, cartoon, USGS cartoon of how a hydropower dam works. You have water behind the dam and the reservoir. They release it through the penstock. It turns a turbine, and you generate electricity. And this is actually really good for society because what this type of operation can do is provide peaking power. So we don't have any storage, at least if, as, as of yet, unless Tesla gets its way. But right now, we don't have any storage on the grid. So we need to meet demand as it, comes, uh, as it peaks up in the middle of the day. It's really expensive for certain power plants to ramp up their power production very quickly. But hydropower dams can do it very cheaply. So they provide a service in that way. But if you look at the stream flow downstream of one of these dams, and we're actually looking at hourly flows on the Deerfield River in Massachusetts. Turns out um, that company TransCanada, the Keystone Pipeline ordeal, they own a lot of hydropower in the Connecticut River as well. And so this is downstream of some of their facilities. You can see the peaking in stream flow, the up-down, up-down motion. And what they're doing there is they're chasing energy prices. They're releasing a lot when energy prices are high in the day, and they're storing water back when energy prices are low. Now this is, good for the, this is good for them. They generate a lot of revenue. And this is good for the grid. 
but this isn't so good for the fish. So the fish evolved over many, 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 many centuries to a hydrologic regime that looks something like this. So this is a tributary actually going into the deer field. It's unregulated, and it's over the same time period. So this is what the flow probably would have looked like if the dams weren't there. And so you can see one storm and generally base flow everywhere else. And so ecologists in the region really don't like this type of operation that the hydroelectric power uh, plants are doing. So what we can do is we can use our water systems models to try and understand the trade-offs between these two objectives. And I'll try to map that out here. So you can imagine on the x-axis here, revenue from hydropower operations, and on the y-axis, some objective, some metric for ecological habitat. And we can use our water systems models to understand how different plans will map onto this objective space. So for instance, we can put in the status quo operations of the hydroelectric dam, and we'll find that we generate a lot of revenue for the hydropower company, but we don't have a lot of suitable aquatic habitat. And the ecologists, they might propose a plan that actually puts us way on the other side, where you don't actually have a lot of revenue anymore from the hydropower uh, production, but you do have a lot of aquatic habitat, maybe because you've gotten rid of all peaking and you've really increased minimum flow out of the dam. And what our model can do is sort of explore alternatives in between these two extremes and find out a good compromise. So for instance, we can try and find an alternative where we do have some peaking, but maybe a little bit less, and maybe the timing has changed, and maybe we do have some a minimum flow, but not as much as the ecologist wanted. And what's nice here is you notice these trade-offs aren't necessarily a straight line between the two extremes. They could have some curvature, which suggests, for instance, the hydroelectric power plant doesn't have to give up that much revenue, and you can actually gain a lot in terms of suitable aquatic habitat. So this is just an example, but this is sort of what water systems planning and management has been designed to do. Now, I haven't mentioned climate change, really, and so I want to bring that in now. You know, how does climate change fit into this? Well, in water system planning and management, one of the key underlying assumptions that has been made for quite some time is this assumption called stationarity, which maybe you've heard about in the previous talks. But you know, stationarity is essentially defined as natural systems, they're going to fluctuate within an unchanging envelope or range of variability. So it's not that river flows are going to be the same every year or that we know what they're going to be in any given year. But from the historical record, we think that we can estimate the range that they're going to fluctuate within. And we can take that historic range and try to apply it to future design plans. And so for instance, if we're back in the Connecticut, I might be interested in the drought of record on the Connecticut. And I can use that drought of record to assess a variety of plans and see how they perform for a variety of objectives. And then we pick the plan that does the best for as many objectives. Also, if we talk about flooding and the flood risk, here I actually have a time series of peak annual flows right upstream of BB Lake here. So on the left, that's a time series of the flows. And on the right, see right there, use the mouse, you have a histogram. And what you can do you know, is take those historic peak flows, assume they represent the risk of flooding going forward, fit a probability model, and maybe estimate the 100-year flood. And then we use that 100-year flood as an estimate of risk for sizing our infrastructure projects. And so the key when we talk about adapt adapting our water systems to climate change is a breakdown in the assumption of stationarity. And once you sort of accept that maybe that assumption is wrong, what do you do? That's the big question. What do you do? So what I want to do for the rest of the talk is, is touch upon three points. And first, I want to kind of go into some of the theoretical developments in the literature on how we adapt water resource systems to climate change. And I want to start with the early developments that actually have continued to now, which is a scenario analysis type approach. Touch upon some of the model improvements, issues with uncertainty characterization and decision relevance that sort of developed and then touch upon some of the more recent approaches, which are based in ro robustness theory, which I'll touch upon later. And then, in, not in necessarily this order, but as I go through that, touch upon at least some examples of how these theories have been applied in practice. And look at adaptation across governance scales, as well as some patterns that we can find in ad adaptation as it goes on in water systems. And then finally, I want to end with just touching on some future directions, some future research needs that I think are needed, as well as some just constraints and adaptation that we really need to tackle. With, uh, tackle. Okay, 
So I'm going to start with scenario-led planning. So again, I was thinking, you know, where to begin, and I figured a good place would be in 1991, there was the first proceedings of the first national conference of climate change and water resources management. And so the Army Corps of Engineers, together with EPA, USGS, Bureau of Reclamation, and NOAA, all came together and put together a symposium to look at climate change and water resources management. And a big part of that conference was understanding regional sensitivities of water systems to global climate change. And the general gist of things went through a scenario analysis approach where they took a handful of climate models and climate scenarios, and they tried to understand the hydrologic response on a regional scale, and then they tried to understand the water system's response. And so the process generally went like this. You take some set of emission scenarios, and you feed them through a general circulation model, which are these highly nonlinear models, and you get projections of hydrologic variables that you care about across the globe, like precipitation and temperature. Now, because water is a local issue, invariably what you have to do is take that large-scale information and apply it and map it down to a local place. Now, because the data coming out of these models can often be very biased with respect to the actual climate of a region, and because the grid cells of these models are so big, I think a couple cover all of New England, we need to bias correct that data and also downscale it to a local region to make it applicable for local analysis. And then we take this local climate projection data, we feed it through a set of hydrologic models to understand the hydrologic response to these different scenarios. We then take the output of those hydrologic models and put them into water resources systems models to understand how our infrastructure is going to perform. And at the end of this whole chain, what we get is a description of water system performance under future climate scenarios. And so there's, there's a lot of examples of this in the literature. An early uh, one from a couple famous authors, Alan Hamlet and Dennis Lettenmeyer in 1999, they looked at the Columbia River Basin, so that you can see the map in the bottom right there of the full system they were looking at. And so in the top right, they made some projections of the hydrology, and so that dark line is the average monthly flow over the historical record, and those uh, squares and triangles, those are projections going forward from some of the scenarios. And so you can see in around the spring, summer, you can see the peak kind of go down and move a little bit earlier into the season, and that's because of increased warming. And then they run their hydrologic scenarios through a water systems model, and in the bottom left, you can see a bunch of different systems objectives under different future scenarios and how they're performing. So they're looking at energy, agriculture, recreation, flood control, and seeing how all these things might change under future climate scenarios. Now, the literature really sort of exploded with this type of approach, and the studies go on and on and on. And this sort of approach has really been the mainstay of, of, of understanding how water systems are going to respond to climate change. And this sort of approach has also informed real life adaptation work that, is, that has been going on. And so I want to touch upon just a couple of examples of that. So it turns out that uh, Little Keene, New Hampshire was one of the first cities to really embrace climate change adaptation in its planning. And so they came out with a report in 2007, adapting to climate change, planning a climate resilient community. And you know, I read through a little bit of that. And what they did was they, they, they took the scientific literature, which suggested through that scenario analysis that certain components of their community were, were vulnerable to climate change. So it was really trying to understand the risks and vulnerabilities that they faced. So for instance, one of the big vulnerabilities they, they, they saw was their culvert capacity. So just in case not everyone's familiar with culverts, it's those things under the road that let a stream pass under a road. So they had really relatively small culverts for their location. And they actually already experienced a lot of flooding where those culverts would blow out and the road would get destroyed during floods. And the climate projection suggested that this was going to get a lot worse in the scenario-led analysis. And so they took that information, but in order to actually adapt, you know, what we, ha what we as academics have to understand is there's already a set of tools, a set of planning tools that are in place at different governance scales. So at the local level, usually cities have master plans where they, it helps guide their investment going forward for a lot of different objectives that the city's trying to meet. And so what Keene tried to do is sort of fit some of this climate change information and projection information into their already existing planning tools. 
And in addition, one thing that Keen really focused on was trying to establish these no regret policies. So when we talk about adaptation, especially at local levels where it often happens, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in climate change projections. I'm going to touch on that a little later. But cities, they have to make a lot of different decisions, and they don't know, they, they're used to dealing with a lot of uncertainty. So they like to make investments where they're not going to regret, no matter what happens, putting the money into what they're going to do. And, so, and this is a common, common pattern amongst adaptation in the real world. So in addition to the local scale, I also want to move up uh, to, the, to the federal scale. And I'm going to be US-centric for the uh, time constraints on the talk. Um, but globally, this, you know, this also applies. Uh, the, the Bureau of Reclamation has really also tried to tackle climate change in its plan. So for those of you not familiar with the Bureau of Rec, uh, they're in charge of a lot of the water infrastructure out west, the big dams out there. And so one, one project that they led was a river basin study where they tried to understand the effects of climate change on some of the major river basins they operated in. And the Colorado River Basin is one of these. There's a study that actually just, one of these studies that just came out that they put out, it's kind of scary. It shows sort of the last few years, supply, the average supply has just been outdone by the average demand of the system on like long-term tenure running means. So they, they recognize that if they don't do something, there's going to be serious conflict in this basin. And they want to understand how, how they can adapt their system and deal with potential future climates that you know, they might have to manage. So they took a scenario-led approach, starting with emission scenarios to global climate models. They downscaled hydrologic models, systems models. And they got a full set of sort of projection data that they could test their system under. And what they actually, what they wanted to do is also test sort of different portfolios of management policies that they could implement and see how they would work. And so they did that, and this is what this graph is showing. But you know, they didn't just limit themselves to the, to the climate projections. They wanted to look at a lot of different type of climate data. So for instance, what we're looking at here on that left column, different types of scenarios. So they looked up to the observed record. They also looked at paleoclimate, and at the bottom, the downscale GCM projections, and then how their different portfolios would perform, how vulnerable they were. And in fact, here, under the downscale projections, they have big problems. So big bars to the right mean big problems. So you know, adaptation is happening at the local scale, at the federal scale, mostly at the local scale. But there's also a lot of resistance. So just a little story. I recently tried to uh, submit a proposal to NSF with a colleague of mine. And we were looking at climate issues in Texas, and water and energy. And we tried to get the Water Texas Development Board uh, to partner with us on this project. And they were excited at first. But then when they read the proposal and they saw climate change, they basically said, I'm sorry, we can't write a letter for you. Because if we write a letter that has anything to do with climate change, we're going to get fired. Because there's a political aspect to this as well. So adaptation happening some, maybe not as much as we would hope. OK, so now I want to move into sort of what developments have been moving forward sort of since the 90s up until now that have sort of changed our view on, on how to look at water system adaptation and, and, and climate change. So I want to talk about model improvements that have happened. Also, our understanding of how much uncertainty there really is has grown. And there's been a shift in focus to really trying to target decision-relevant information that we can extract from the climate projections. So what I want to actually do is going back to that 1991 climate change symposium, there was one author who contributed a paper who had this quote, it's Peter Rogers from Harvard, and I'll just read it because it's, it's kind of funny. He said, I believe that the typical large climate models are irrelevant to my topic, namely what engineers need to know about climate change. Even if the models were scientifically well-grounded and their predictions were considered to be perfect, implying that he doesn't think that, I still maintain that they are largely irrelevant to practical engineering decisions. Now, it's an interesting quote. And I'd actually highlight something, just, just so you know, I guess full disclosure, this guy is the advisor of my old advisor, Casey Brown at UMass. And Peter Rogers is a very smart guy. So you, know, you might look at this and say, well, climate skeptic, you know, ignore, but maybe not. So what, the arguments he made were this. First, if you look at the output of the climate models for variables that are needed for water systems management, like precipitation, for instance, 
at least when he was looking at them, they really weren't very good. So how much can they be trusted is one question. But in addition to that, because there have been improvements, he also stressed, you know, when we do water systems planning, you gotta think about the planning horizon. So, you know, we usually apply discount rates when we make investments. And the general discount rates we use, we don't plan that far. We don't plan 100 years in advance when we make decisions. Maybe we go 10 years, maybe 25 years in advance. And then when you look at the climate projections and you don't really start seeing signals until 2050, 2075, the relevance becomes a little bit iffy, to say the least. And then the last thing, the last point he made was, well, you know, there's a lot of other factors besides climate that can swamp the issues and the uncertainties surrounding our engineering practice. And to sort of push those to the side is a mistake. So I wanna kinda of go through some of these issues in a little more detail and then try and coalesce around a solution. So when Peter Rogers made his comment, uh, it was a long time ago and the climate models were maybe not as, as nearly as good as they are now. So what we're looking at here, the FAR, SAR, this is the first, second, third, and fourth climate assessment and sort of the average resolution of the climate models in these. And what this is supposed to be a map of is Europe. In the top left, you know, you might not know that, but if you look at the bottom right, you do. And you can see a lot of the topography really pulling out and the resolution of these models. So we expect, you know, topography, for instance, controls local climate very much. So as the topography gets better and as the resolution gets better, we would think the models would do better at replicating the historical climate under historical conditions. And they do, in fact, get better. So this is a 2013 paper. And what we're looking at here in the top, middle, and bottom plots are the older, less old, and newest generation of climate models. And the longer those bars are, the worse the models were at reproducing precip and temp across the globe. And so we can see as the models have, have sort of evolved, they have gotten better. And that's sort of, that, that should be encouraging. But the issue is that's not necessarily the case at the local scale. So here's a very similar time period. Here's a paper that was showing basically the reproduction of precip on a monthly time scale in Eastern India. And they looked at many models, I pulled out two. And again, we're looking at the second, third, and fourth generation models. And so here, that black line in both plots is the observed average monthly precipitation in this region. And the bars are the reproduction by the different generations of climate model. So if you look, so if you, the blue is the most new models, the green, the middle, and the red, the oldest models. If you look at the top plot, the new models do seem to improve certain aspects. So in August and September, they're much closer to that high precip than the previous generations were. But if you look in June, they actually got a little worse. And if you look at the ECHA model down below, in July and August and September, the newer models also got a little worse. So like, what do you, what do you take from that? So you can get improvements at the global scale. It doesn't necessarily mean at the local scale for the variables that we need to know about for water system planning, things are necessarily getting better. And this issue, this uncertainty issue about the models, it, it's part of a larger issue of uncertainty that's really plaguing water systems planning. And so here, Wilby and Desai in, in 2009, they came out with this cascade of uncertainty. And what it's showing is sort of as you go through these climate impact assessments for water systems and any local impact system, at every step, uncertainty from the previous step sort of propagates and it gets wider and wider and wider and wider. And by the time you're done, the uncertainty can be so big that it's hard to make sense of what to do with this information. How do you actually use it for planning? So I wanna to touch on some of the uncertainties that actually emerge in here. One, which is maybe kind of interesting, is that GCMs, even a large ensemble of GCMs, they don't necessarily delimit the full range of potential climate changes that we could face. And you know, the question is, how do you know this? Well, Usually what we do is we take emissions, you know, we take emission scenarios, put them to the GCMs, and look at a range of climate changes that we might wanna plan for. But some of the work, uh, I did some work in the, in the southeast in the Apalachicola chattahoochee flint River Basin, and what we're looking at here is some climate projections for that region. On the x-axis is changes in precipitation, on the y-axis is changes in temperature. And we have two generations of models. So it's a big ensemble of models, but two generations. 
The CMIP3 is the older generation, and then they updated it with the CMIP5. If you look at the CMIP3, those dark dots, and you look at precip, you can see that maybe at the driest, as we move to the left on the x-axis, we get to about a 20, less 15% decline in precip, and we have some wet outliers on the right. But if you look at the new generation of models, you get much drier extremes on the left, more than 20% declines. And so there's no reason to not expect that in the next generation of climate models come out, the range might change again. And so if you use that third generation set of projections for your planning, and assume that they were delimiting generally the range of changes you could see, you, you would be surprised when the next generation came out. In addition to that sort of issue, another issue that I think is really important to stress is just the issue of natural variability. And so I'm trying to think, how do you show chaotic variability? So here's a little animation of a chaotic uh, double rod pendulum. So the idea here is you have this double rod pendulum, you set it up, you let it go, and it starts bouncing around, and it's a very chaotic system. And it traces out this line, but if you were to change the initial conditions of where you let that pendulum go just a little bit, the path that it would trace out would be completely different. And the climate system can be very similar. The projections that we have can be very sensitive to initial conditions. And not only that, the projections, the variability that they try and capture doesn't necessarily always match the variability of the local systems in the observed record. So you know, here's a, a figure from Hawkins and Son, it's 2009. And what we're looking at here is for decadal average precipitation over Europe, we're looking at projections through time starting at the year 2000 and moving over to 2100 or so. And we're looking at how much of the variability in a set of projections is explained from different sources. And what this is essentially saying is that early on in the first 20, 25 years of these projections, the main cause for the spread in the projections is natural variability. And it's only until you get later that emission scenarios really account for any of the variability amongst the projections. So, you know, again, this just makes it more and more difficult to how do you deal with this, especially because it's hard to run climate models many, 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 many times because they're very expensive to run, so it's hard to delimit the variability. So, you know, all of that was uncertainty issues with the climate models, but we can just keep on going. So we have to take those climate projections and feed them through a set of hydrologic models. And there can be a lot of uncertainty with that as well. So here's some work I did with a colleague in the Kabul River Basin in Afghanistan. And basically what this is showing on the right there is that for different hydrologic models, the blue bars is the amount of uncertainty in flood projections due to the hydrologic model itself. And the green bar is the amount of uncertainty due to the climate projections. And the red bar is how much uncertainty combined. And so we do that for a couple different hydrologic models at a couple different locations throughout the basin. And the point here is for certain types of hydrologic responses that we care about, like flooding, the hydrologic modeling can contribute a non-trivial portion of the uncertainty. So this just makes it even larger. And then we want to talk about planning you know, water systems and water supply. You got to also talk about societal development and demands. And so this, this plot I love, actually. So this is from the Tampa Bay Water District. And what we're looking at is deliveries through time. And you can see in the July, you know, 08, 09 period during the Great Recession, this crash in water demand. And it really hasn't recovered to where it was. And the reason is water demand is linked to economic activity. And so if you have a crushing recession that can change the economic activity of a region, you can change the water needs of that region. And no one, obviously no one projected that, no one forecasted that. So here's their projections of demand at different points in time. So the blue line is the actual water demands. And you see these different forecasts made at different times in the record. And you can see, you know, they keep on shooting up. You know, starting in 2002, projection shoots up. In 2007, it shoots up. And really, demand crashed because of that recession. And they didn't see it coming. And this can be just as important for how our water systems are able to meet our needs going forward as is climate change. Okay. So I listed maybe a lot of problems, a lot of uncertainties, and um, now the question is how do you, you know, how, how we've come around to dealing with these issues. And you know, what we were doing with the scenario-led analysis, a lot of the times, 
We were taking our water systems models, we're taking a series of scenarios from climate projections, and we're trying to essentially optimize the system to meet sort of the expected projections that we, we think are gonna come to meet the needs going forward. And there's been a shift recently for how we do this water system planning, and that's been towards robustness-based approaches. And so the idea here is instead of trying to optimize your system for an expected change coming to you, what you're really trying to do, or what you maybe should be trying to do, is find solutions that will work reasonably well for many objectives under a wide range of possible conditions. And this might seem obvious, you know, maybe to some, but this isn't necessarily what people were doing. So there's been lots of development in this idea of robustness-based planning for water systems under climate change. One approach here, uh, early approaches, was just to, to stop the top-down approaches to these studies. So instead of starting with the climate projections and feeding them through your models and coming up with a set of sort of water system scenarios, what we do is just a sensitivity analysis, a simple sensitivity analysis. So here, some authors out of the UK, they were interested in flood risk and potential climate change. And so what they did is systematically change the total amount of precip falling, mean annual precip, that's the y-axis. The x-axis is seasonal variation in the precip regime. And then they mapped out how flood risk would change under these varying conditions, and that's the colors. Where as you move darker in purple, you're getting more and more flood risk. And this, just, this can give managers an, just a map to see how sensitive their system really is to climate change. And then once you've done this, you can superimpose onto this any number of projections that you want, any types of projections that you want, to get a sense of where they say you might be. And the you know, this isn't that big of a change, but the reason it's nice is twofold. One, when new sets of projections come out, you don't have to redo the analysis. You can sort of map it onto your sensitivity analysis right away. And two, even if all the projections are sort of clustered and suggest you have no risk, if this sort of analysis suggests that you're highly sensitive, then you might choose to make investments anyway, because you don't necessarily trust the climate models to begin with, at least for local scale adaptation. So these sorts of robustness approaches have really been building momentum. Uh, some folks here at Cornell, so Pat Reed in civil engineering and one of his students, John Herman, who's now at UC Davis, they did a, a nice set of work looking at, in North Carolina, the water system there. And there, they, you know, what they did was they looked at all of these different possible stressors on the water system, from climate, demand, capacity issues, and costs they might face. And they would explore a full range of uncertainties from all of these factors. And what they would do is, they, you know, in a very computationally expensive way, they run all of these different scenarios for all of these different factors. And what they try to do is map out and identify alternative plans that provide a, a minimum level of performance across a variety of, of objectives. And so here what we're looking at is on the x-axis in this bottom left plot, sort of the sensitivity of inflow scaling, and on the y-axis, changes in demand growth. And all those dots are all these different scenarios that they tested. And the green dots are the ones that succeed or that provide good enough performance for all the objectives we care about, and the gray ones don't. And John actually went forward and he sort of, as he moved forward with this, he tried to build out a taxonomy of all these robustness approaches that are emerging in the literature. And you know, he identified four main components to them. Basically, how do we identify alternatives? How do we generate this wide array of scenarios to sort of test the sensitivity of our systems? How do we measure robustness or good enough performance? And also, you know, how do we understand which factors really are controlling whether or not our systems are going to be robust under future uncertainties. And this, you know, I, I think this is sort of where we want to go in adaptation. And to be honest, I think that local governments have sort of been adopting this a little bit without even maybe knowing, or they knew it, but academics didn't know it. Because a lot of this, a lot of the plans that come out here often are low regret plans, or plans that you can do no matter what's going to happen, and you're going to feel good about the investment you made. So these, these climate robustness frameworks, they, they have started to make their way into the real world. So 
One utility I did some work with out in Colorado, Colorado Springs, they're trying to generate their, their new integrated water resources plan for the next 25 years. And they, they really wanted to be at the forefront of adaptation. And so they, they reached out and, and wanted to sort of expand how they do their analysis. And this is a little picture on the left is their system. And on the right is sort of their map of how they go through the process of adaptation. And you know, we worked with them to this, sort of map out the climate risks that they face in a sort of a bottom-up, vulnerability-based approach. You're generating a picture that looks something like this. So again, this is one of these climate response surfaces where for different temperature changes and different precipitation changes, before even using the climate models, we try to understand where their system will perform acceptably, maybe not optimally, but acceptably. And in the bottom right there, where they might perform unacceptably. And then afterwards, we then map out the climate information. And so those contours there are two different sets of projections of climate information. And the red contour is sort of, you can see it's sort of dipping into the unacceptable region, which means they might have a tail risk of reaching unacceptable performance. And then they want to target that tail risk and try and figure out which adaptation measures are best to sort of minimize that. An interesting thing with this system, what I'm showing you here is we, we did this under their current demands. If you actually look at what they're projecting their demands to be going forward, more than half this map is red. So they, again, at west, there are big water issues. So what I, I want to wrap everything up by just talking about some future directions of where I think research needs to go. And often when we talk about adaptation and, and water systems, you got to work with water managers, you got to work with stakeholders, and you do have to convince them of the need. And often, when you do that, you want to show evidence that there is change going on. And this can be somewhat tricky. So what we're looking at here is peak flows in the Red River up in North Dakota. And the record goes from 1900 all the way to now. And anyone looking at this would probably say, yeah, it looks like things are trending up. Flood risk is getting worse. Someone might jump to say, oh, this must be climate change. But it turns out this record actually goes back to 1880. And when you include that, you see all these somewhat higher floods in the earlier record. And then the issue starts coming in. Are the trends we're seeing trends? Or are they just sort of long-lived natural fluctuations in the climate system? And this isn't to suggest that trends aren't happening because of climate change with hydrologic extremes. But it is suggesting it's not necessarily easy to identify them at the local scale and convince people of climate change. So some people find it a little easier to go to the paleo record to inform water management adaptation for climate, and you can have a little bit of an easier time. So uh, this guy, Ed Cook, who's at Lamont, uh, he's done a lot of work with tree rings. And so what he's showing here is a series of climate projections for a region in the West, and it's showing that over time things are getting drier. But then he sort of counters that or compares that to his paleo record of tree rings. And I think maybe you saw some of this with the mega drought. But essentially, the idea here is after 1300, it's actually been relatively wet. But prior to 1300, the tree rings would suggest it's been very, very dry. And at least in my experience, this is easier to communicate and motivate the need for adaptation response than the climate models, at least when you're talking to water managers. So in Colorado Springs, they were very skeptical of the climate models, but they were all in on the paleo record. And the thing is, it might get you to the same place which is a more robust system. So maybe for political reasons, it could be a good way to go. In addition, one other research change that I think we need to move towards is, at least from the water system side, a more mechanistic focus. So in the past, what we've done is we've taken climate projections. We've just sort of taken the projections of precip and temperature and other hydrologic variables of interest over our region, downscaled them, and then put them into our models. And I don't feel that we've really done a thorough sort of assessment of how credible the reproduction of the climate mechanisms are that are leading to the climate over the area. And there actually might be some promise here because, so for instance, we're looking at California. One of the mechanisms that drives flooding there, something called the Pineapple Express or Atmospheric Rivers, which you might have heard. And some recent work out uh, from the Scripps Institute shows that the climate models actually reproduce these reasonably well. And they might be more credible at simulating these large-scale mechanisms than local-scale, let's say, convective precip. 
So by focusing in on the mechanisms, we might get a better understanding of what credible climate projections we can use in water systems adaptation. And finally, and from a research point of view, there's been a big move lately, you know, NSF, National Science Foundation, they're really pushing this idea of, they like to call it the food, energy, water nexus. So when we talk about water systems, it's hard to separate the performance of water systems from other sectors that they interact with, both agriculture and the production of energy. And just understanding the dynamics of these systems and how they respond to climate stresses, there may be low-hanging fruit that we can hit that can help improve all of these systems and improve their robustness to different stressors like climate change and also things like population growth. And in addition, I just stress that as we do, as we expand our framework for how we look at our systems, I think we need more tools for improving shorter term horizon planning. So I think uh, you had uh, Toby all come in and maybe talk a little bit about seasonal forecasts. They also have new decadal climate projections that go about 10 years. And if we can embed flexible management in our systems to leverage this sort of information, basically we might be able to manage the noise in the system and that might help adapt us to the longer term trends that end up emerging. And again, stressing low regret strategies as we try and go forward with this. And then I just want to end with this, and it might seem off topic, but you know, we, as a society, we, ha we need to invest. We need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to invest in our water systems. And so what, <laughs> these are bottles of water taken from Flint, Michigan. It's from a Times article, but it's actually generated by a research team in Virginia Tech. And these are just taken from a tap, I think, every week moving forward. And you can see the, uh, well, it, it's getting worse. <laughs> so as a society, we need to come together and really understand that these things aren't free. And we need to put the money and resources into sort of protecting the infrastructure we have built up for ourselves. And it's an opportunity to reinvest and try to adapt these systems going forward for, for the uncertainties that we face. And so with that, I'll end. Uh, thank you and take any questions. So you talk about water being a local issue, but it's really more about management that you're talking about, the infrastructure being local, because how do things like the glacier melt and the effect of that, which has a very much larger than local impact, fit in with the terminologies you're using here? Sure. So, and when you say glacier melts, do you mean local glaciers that feed water systems, or just you mean more broadly? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, and so, you know, when I was thinking how to do this talk, hydrology is a very wide field. And you know, I, I come from a water systems background, so I decided to focus in on that. But there's differences between adaptation and mitigation. So for issues of, let's say, sea level rise from the melting waters at the poles, this is, and it's so difficult, Basically, the, the global community has to come together to mitigate climate change, to try and prevent those issues. But the city of Keene, for instance, well, they might want to do their part. They want to lower their emissions. They're, they need to be responsive to their constituents. You know, and the people who are making the decisions at that level, they're elected officials in the end. And so they have to be responsive to their local constituents and what they need. And so it's, it's really, it's, it's a very challenging issue of scales. And there are many different scales that decisions are being made at and that decisions need to be made at to address different types of challenges. And so at such a global scale with melting uh, ice caps, unfortunately it requires global cooperation, which is not a, an easy thing. But I guess one thing I'd say, you know, they. You know, mayors, there's that mayor consortium for climate change. So you can, it can be a bottom-up process, or we can try and make it a bottom-up process. Uh, and I think education is the key to do that. I think the more people learn about what they can do, you can sort of create a groundswell of uh, public outcry for change and then public trying to make that change happen at the local level, which I think is it's promising.
So when you're looking at the factors that uh, we need to be able to build into our systems in order to adapt for possible changes in the future from climate change, how much do we, in our current state, look to the climate models that we know to be like the most credible, and how much do we now, especially after COP21, have to consider um, the effects of climate mitigation and how those models hopefully could change for the better? Um, do we adapt for like extremes, or do we trust that we're going to be able to actually limit our carbon emissions um, and plan for like a slightly more middle risk scenario? Okay. So I'll, I'll try and tackle, I heard two questions maybe there. Um, the first one, so it's funny, trying to figure out which climate models perform better. I think the um, agreement on that is that there's no agreement on that, and that it turns out that that's not necessarily an easy task, although it might seem so. Because sometimes certain models perform better with some variables and not better with other variables that you're tracking. And all of them are sort of a representation of the physics that are going on in the background. So how do you actually determine which model is better is not entirely clear. To the second question, and I think what you were getting at is, you know, how do we adapt our systems to some of the extreme projections that might be going on? And I think most, in the real world, in most governance levels that actually make these decisions, what they're really trying to do is figure out what is politically feasible for them that they can get through that will probably deal with a lot of the challenges they're facing now anyway, and then hopefully we'll get them in a better place, sort of no matter what changes occur. But you know, the climate projections, I feel you know, they're kind of used as an impetus to say things are going to get worse. But it's not necessarily, you know, people aren't necessarily taking the most extreme one and saying we have to make sure we're okay with that. Because Often, you know, the money that would go into maybe making that happen, it's just, it's not there. It's not there. And so people, you know, decision makers are constrained, and they've always been constrained, and they'll continue to be constrained with resources. And I think they're just trying to find the lowest regret strategies they can that meet a lot of these challenges, both current and projected. Uh, I have a different question. Um, I think you pointed out that with or without climate change, we've got a water problem. And it's been there for a long, long time. And my question is this. Uh, I think in my area, which is uh, actually Asia, uh, the question is training people in hydrology, climatology, uh, where do you send them? Do you, do you send them to Cornell? Or, or do you send them yeah. somewhere else? Uh, because uh, it seems to me that uh, we were doing more here at Cornell uh, 20 years ago when we had a lot of USA funding and stuff like that. But uh, I think the question is capacity building to handle this. Are we really training people and where is the best place to go? I, I think that's a really, really good point. And I think uh, other people have identified that issue. And just to give one example to that, I was talking to Peter just when we were walking over. NSF, you know, one challenge they see and one opportunity they see to deal with these sorts of issues is that linkage between different systems, water, energy, food, that's their big one right now. And they're looking to educate people in, you know, how, in, in knowledge about how to kind of bridge across those systems and come up with strategies that raise all boats rather than, for instance, like biofuels. You can maybe do better with green energy, but you hurt water and you maybe hurt food. And so they're, they're putting money in developing sort of education centers to try and tackle some of these challenges. Where, you know, where you currently send people to go, I, I don't know, I don't know. Here's good, you know, why not? Well, you know, I'm going from here to a seminar on the future of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. and the World Bank was critical at one point in uh, providing uh, green revolution type uh, technology, but I don't know what the World Bank is doing now. Maybe it does have a future. Well, you know, I actually, I'm a, I've, I've been loosely related to several World Bank projects. You know, they're still building infrastructure um, in developing parts of the world. And to be honest, that's where the infrastructure is probably needed most. So, 
they're trying to struggle right now through how to do climate change planning for their infrastructure investments. Um, that's, that's an ongoing issue, and they're reaching out to different faculty, my old advisor included, to sort of work through how to develop their approach to how to do that. All right, we might have time for one more question. Environmental impact assessment is all about predictions of impacts and ways of mitigation. So before um, allowing a project to take place, there, is, there, is, there are modulations, there are decisions taken upon a, a, a future. So when you see this kind of uncertainty that you're talking about, how has uh, the United States has dealt with that uh, when I'm talking about the environmental permits uh, I, I would like to know. Uh, so would I. Um, I. I don't think they have for the most part. So I, you know, I, there's many, many different, you know, everything's state by state a lot of the time with the permitting for different water issues. So you can go to any state and get a different answer. Uh, I'll give you my experiences in the Northeast. So for water withdrawal permitting, you know, we're not terribly uh, drought prone here, but there has been some issues with withdrawing too much water and it hurts the ecology. And they have no real plan to deal with it, with climate change. It just doesn't, it didn't come in to the permitting issue. In fact, they just got to designing permits to incorporate issues with uh, ecological flows to begin with. So, you know, it's complicated mainly because governance here is very different than governance, let's say, in different places around the world, in Europe, which occasionally can be a little more centralized than here. Here it's very distributed. And so it, it can be location dependent. And with a lot of issues, these uncertainties and these, let's say, climate change issues really haven't been addressed. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.